I am Keith Pavelic. Uh, I was introduced to South Texas Natives. I've been part of South Texas Natives Project since 2002. For those of y'all that don't know what that, that is or was, it was a native plant project with the goals of making native plant material commercially available that was locally adapted. And I'll define locally adapted a little more uh, later. But uh, South Texas Natives was successful and in 2010, one of our major funders, uh, the Texas Department of Transportation, asked us to uh, go bigger. And so we uh, started a project called the Texas Native Seeds Program. And with that, we picked up Central and West Texas. Um, and revisiting that, that was 2010. Uh, revisiting that this year, they came back to us and said, go bigger. And so we went to uh, a whole statewide project, and I'll get to that. Uh, so where it all began, uh, this is a summary of, of kind of what we do. Uh, but like I mentioned, we, we try to develop local ecotypes and get them commercially available. That's kind of the short and sweet of it. Uh, we provide seed stock to commercial growers, so we're not actually selling it. Uh, we make uh, a little royalties off of it if, if the uh, release is released in a certain format that we can do so. Uh, you know, that equals about, right now, about $2,000 a year, not a whole lot. Mainly what that's for is just to have a little bit of grower buy-in. Uh, we, we do that. Uh, it's a little incentive for them. They get to be uh, the only grower or a group of growers that are growing a specific product. And we found with some species that have a marginal market, we need to do that to get it out there. Uh, and so our mission is to develop native seed sources for Texas now. It started in South Texas, and we just uh, got into the coastal prairies uh, region, so to speak, with funding. We've been operating here, uh, you know, we've done talks across the state, but we've had no specific funding for the coastal prairies region. Uh, this is a map of our, our project regions as of now, and like I said, we're statewide now, so Texas Native Seeds really fits our program better. Uh, we're not dropping the South Texas Natives program by any means, but we are kind of moving to that Texas Native Seeds uh, project name, and that will better identify us with larger groups across the state. Uh, these are the, the folks that are lead, leading the charge in each region. Uh, Doug Jobes, and actually I have a typo. That should be Coastal Prairies, not East Texas. Uh, and I'll introduce him at the end of the presentation, but Doug Jobes is our local guy. Uh, he just brought on October 1, uh, so he's still getting his feet wet, so to speak, and we kind of threw him into the fire. As many of y'all know, uh, native plants uh, tend to produce a lot of seed in the fall, and so he's got his hands full right now uh, just trying to get a hold of that, plus our evaluation sites, which some of you have already seen, and some of y'all might see this afternoon if you choose to go on that. So we are a program of the Caesar Clayburgh Wildlife Research Institute at Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Uh, but we're all basically grant funded. So we have no hard money from the state. Uh, a lot of it's private donations and then there are uh, larger uh, donations from both state and federal agencies. Uh, this is a map of all the collections that we've made to date in the, uh, in the state of Texas. As you can see, the coastal prairie region is blank. Um, we didn't have the funding to send people up here to do that. Now that being said, we are working with cooperators like the Nature Conservancy that have people here that have had people collecting. And we use their collections to jumpstart our project and some of the things we're doing. So, uh, you know, what does it take? And in South Texas, we've been successful and that project, uh, I guess that line of, of uh, thought and our, our steps to get there are working in other areas of the state. So I'll just kind of go into what we do. Uh, we first go out and get plant material that is eco, uh, ecotypic. So in the coastal prairies region, that map, we're collecting plants all through that region. Uh, once we get that, we, we test those plants and we select a group of them. We're not selecting one, we're not selecting the winner, we're selecting a group of let's say little blue stem, it may be three, it may be five different little blue stems that will hopefully become a commercial uh, release. And that is to kind of 
have a product that will work across the coastal prairies region, not just you know right here along the coast or farther in. Uh, and then once we have that, we determine the best management practices or planting practices, restoration practices, you name it. We do research and all that. Uh, and, and basically we're trying to, trying to give people a blueprint for success. Uh, and if you notice that comes after the plant material. And there's a specific reason for that. When we started South Texas Natives, we started doing some research and we found out without the material, you can't really figure out how to plant something. Uh, you can plant stuff from other areas of the state and, uh, or you know, other areas of the country that are commercially available, but they just don't do well. And so you can't really do quality research without having a product that's gonna work. Um, the other things that we do is education. Uh, we do a lot of talks like this. Uh, we do field days. Uh, you know, we're happy, happy to do that sort of thing that really lends itself well to the end product of our, our, uh, our game, you know, our end goal. And then we support, and by that meaning we work with other entities to try to help them help us. You know, we're all in this together. It's a large, large undertaking to do native plant restoration. So uh, I'm gonna go through a series of slides and, and kind of problems or opportunities is my, uh, my kind of thing. And, and I address this for the coastal prairies. So the two yellow pins, if you can make them out, those are our current evaluation sites. Uh, you know, pretty, pretty good distance in between. Pretty, pretty different ecologically speaking with soils uh, and, and weather. Uh, but okay, so the big thing in the middle of that map is Houston. And okay, so we've got this big guy right here staring us down in the face. And is, is, is Houston and its urban growth, is that a problem or is that an opportunity? And the purist in me says, well, that's a problem. We need to keep everybody in the tightest area we can and keep the native stuff native. But being in this project long enough, I've come to realize that when urban sprawl goes, there's opportunities there. There's drainage ditches, uh, Houston flood control district. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to put natives back on the ground. And if we have plant material that they can use, we can make that happen. And if they're successful, if you don't have material, they're gonna put it into something and it's often Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, things that we don't necessarily like. So again, I think that's an opportunity. It's gonna happen whether we like it or not. Let's figure out how we can make the best of it. Uh, this is another Google Earth shot and you can kind of see some big lines there. And those aren't highways, those are transmission lines or pipelines. Again, uh, a lot of people will kind of work adversaries, adversarially uh, against oil and gas or energy production. Uh, we've taken a different approach. Uh, again, I feel like it's going to happen one way or another, so let's jump on the bandwagon and help them succeed. So there's a big pipeline currently running from Midland, Texas to, Houston, to the port of Houston. And that is, I forget how many thousands of acres, but it's, it's a big, big pipeline. And for the first time, we've been able to help provide seeding recommendations for a pipeline of that size. We did a large one in South Texas, but for uh, this is basically a statewide pipeline, I mean, stretching clear across the state. And we were able to provide recommendations. Uh, now we didn't, because there's not a lot of material available, ecotypic to the region, we had to do the best we could, but getting natives down instead of introduce is, is the doorway. Uh, we intend, as we get more products out there, to be able to switch to fully ecotypic in each region. In West Texas, they are able to do some ecotypic seedings already due to this project. Uh, so again, opportunity, I think. Okay, and another uh, specific to the Coastal Prairies region, this is El Campo, De oh, I, okay, there we go. El Campo Dead in the Center. All the lighter shades, that's farmland. Uh, many of you know the LCRA, all the water districts, changing water usage policies. Now they may give a lot of water back now that the rains have started. But, uh, you know, as that happens, farmland comes out. And having something to put back there is crucial. And again, we don't have that. We don't have seed ecotypic to the coastal prairie to do thousands of acres. And that is 
large, big chunks at a time that's going to go into something. Uh, cattle production is historic down here, and so a lot of it's going to go into something that cattle can eat. And if we can sort of turn that thought process into native range, and we can really sell that. And there's, there's actually cattle markets that are starting to sell that too. So again, I think an opportunity. So uh, these are going to be pictures of what we've done in South Business. And so the landowner had a choice. And the landowner, through some NRCS uh, programs as well, cost sharing, planted a high diversity native, uh, native mix. And uh, this mix included, I believe, 15 different species of grasses that he could buy commercially because of our project in South Texas. And it also included uh, seven forbs and three legumes uh, also. And uh, so that's a pretty good diverse mix. Uh, down here in the bottom corner, you can see onless bush sunflower. Uh, there was another one, I can't see it, but uh, there's several Forbes species in there. Again, uh, some legumes, bundle flowers, uh, deer pea vetch, those type of things. Uh, and then your big grasses. And, and basically, the thought process behind this is hunting in South Texas is starting to pay more than cattle leases. And so by being able to turn this back into a native prairie, quail are going to thrive, deer are going to thrive. This was actually down along the New Aces River. So uh, have some deer already frequenting the river area, they'll come out into that. And so it's, it's, it's a monetary gain for the landowner, but it's also just an end good for, uh, you know, the environment and natives in general. So this is a pipeline uh, that went up through an area around George West, if any of y'all know where that's at. Uh, pretty caliche hilltops. Uh, historically would have been a hard region to get natives to take hold just because of the, the species out there. And I, and I talked about it out in the field, but I'll talk about it now. A large part of what we do is we don't just go for the late successional species. We go for early, mid, and late to sort of have that natural, uh, you know, progression. Uh, and, and we've learned on pipelines, they leave them so, uh, I guess, degraded would be probably the word. But they're so mixed up, even if you have them do the best things they can do, double ditching, putting the, bo you know, the, the bottom layer of soil back in first, the top layer back on, uh, and then the top soil back on, you're still having a highly mixed site. So those early successional species are key to, to sort of getting that hold on those things. And so uh, most of the dominant stuff you'll see in, in this area is slender grama and then side oats grama, so early and mid-successional species. You'll see, you can probably pick out, I think that's a four flower trichloris, which is one of our late successional species for South Texas. And again, that will rotate to what it's supposed to be, but we're giving nature the chance to do that. But by covering it up, we prevent unwanted invasives like King Ranch blue stem and other things from dominating the site. Another uh, interesting thing with this picture is this is a research project and you can pretty much see the line. This here was planted with what the pipeline bought and could buy at the same time. And as you can see, there's not much and really a lot of what that is, this is two years old, a lot of that is seed rain of our species over there. And so that's a good point that seeding those species that come out of Kansas, Oklahoma, even North Texas, they don't do it where they're not supposed to. And that north to south gradient is huge. We can move a lot of stuff east to west if we have the right soils and the same climate. Uh, but that north to south really is a, a booger on native plants. Here's another pretty successful pipeline. Uh, this is actually a flow line, so a little bit less construction, but nonetheless, uh, pink pappas grass, side oats grama, red love grass. This was actually in the post oak prairie region up around uh, north of Carn City. Uh, so really kind of at the tip of what we're calling uh, coastal prairies would be down in there as well, and then our east Texas region as well. And so, again, without this, it's going to be Clayburg blue stem or buffalo grass, uh, other things that we don't like. And here it would be Bahia grass, Bermuda grass, other things. Uh, and so I know that the, the task was lessons learned, things to do to, to help, okay? And, and all those other things, well, the seed is very, very important. Another thing is application methods. This is a visual obstruction berm, but anywhere a steep slope, hydro seeding, very, uh, very efficient, very uh, 
friendly, helps hold that slope together until your grasses get established. Uh, so kind of my, my rundown of lessons learned is going to be ecotypic seed of known quality. So seed from your region or as close as you can get to it. Uh, quality, PLS, Aaron mentioned that. Pure live seeds per square foot. When you plant something, uh, you want to know how many actual seeds are going down that are going to have a chance to germinate. Uh, and so 20 pure live seeds is the NRCS standard recommendation. Uh, you know, in a lot of critical steep slopes, we use twice that. You can get by with a little less, but if you just go and buy a bag of seed, unknown quality, you can put 100 seeds down, but if only 50 of them are, are alive, you've already cut your thing in half. You know? So that's something very important, and uh, I'd be happy to explain some of that more in detail if uh, anybody's interested. Um, adequate supply of that high quality ecotypic seed. The kind of one of the worst things we can do is get people so amped up to do something and then not have seed available. Uh, when that happens, they're already putting the money into prep probably before they even called you. So they're putting something down. And so we want to kind of slow that down, educate them. That's my next thing. We want to educate people on the steps, on the timelines. Like Aaron said, some of this stuff takes two or three years before it's, it's kind of fully successful. And we don't want people to waste that money on year one thinking that, oh, I just have a weed patch. We want them to know that it takes time. Uh, and we can do that through the next thing, demonstrations. Uh, you do demonstration plannings, take pictures, give presentations. People start to understand that it takes time, that there's successional stages there, and that you know a, a weedy mess to start out is not, not everything uh, that's going to doom you. Uh, planning. Planning is very important. Uh, you want to plan before you start anything. Site prep. The proper site prep. Uh, if we're going in out here, maybe glyphosate and no tilling. Uh, you know, maybe you do have to till. That's some of the things you have to think about. Uh, proper planting. Using proper equipment to place that seed at the optimum depth. Uh, a lot of times people will broadcast out, like Aaron was saying, but then the next thing they do is get an offset disc and go offset it. Well, you've buried that seed six inches deep, it's not going to come up. Native seed needs to be within that quarter inch uh, to half inch slot. Um, and then patience, I, I think I mentioned that. And so, uh, Doug, why don't you come on up here. Uh, I want to introduce Doug Jobes. He's our uh, new guy for the Coastal Prairie. That's his contact info. He uh, will also be glad to share it with you. We don't have business cards for him just yet. Uh, but Doug, Doug uh, we, we stole him from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, hope nobody gets too mad at us. Uh, we think Doug's got a lot of experience in the region. Uh, he's worked out of Victoria, and then before that was Jackson. Jackson. Uh, and so he's familiar with the area. He's excited, and we're excited to have him. We've really been needing this to kind of jumpstart this project. And then lastly, I'd like to thank the people that are supporting us in the region as of this time, uh, WHF, uh, Jim was up here earlier. Uh, they've been a partner since 2017. They've given us working space, plot space, uh, technical expertise, collections. Uh, the other thing, they've been with the project helping us along uh, probably since 2005, if I remember the first time I met Jim. Uh, and then uh, Texas Nature Conservancy and specifically this uh, Prairie Preserve here. Again, working space, uh, collections, those type of things are, are uh, very, very valuable to us. All the collections that the Nature Conservancy has put into those uh, plant material centers where we can take some of that seed and test it, that has saved us, instantly saved us uh, thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not cheap to have an uh, employee dedicated to a region. And so that kind of already jump-started this project. You'll see our plots. The, re the reason we were able to have plots before we hired somebody was because of those collections. Uh, and that's it for me. Uh, any questions?